Oh, yeah. He just drives from the Miracle Falls to Paul. He doesn't come home for very long. <laughs> he gets home about six and eats and or showers and eats and watches about 15 minutes of TV and goes to bed. Gets up at, I think he gets up at three now. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. I couldn't survive on a schedule like that. But he must like it. Or he likes it well enough he's willing to talk about it. that first album that is best. <laughs> It took me the longest time to readjust for my books were because of all of my notes, you know. Mm -hmm. And that uh, because I, we were talking into it, you know, how to order it off and then you could find Okay. Hello. Oh, I made copies too, finally. Yeah. Hey, your thing's on. Okay, already. Yeah. It's recording, she said. Yeah. It's not, it's not streaming. It's so hard oh, okay. To do. But it will get streamed. Okay. So, for four people that are tuning in. So, hey, I'm excited about the study I'm going to do after this one. I found a great book by uh, an author that I really like and trust on the history of the land of Israel and kind of the biblical history of that. And so it's going to be neat because we're going to be looking, spending a lot of time in the scriptures, but we're going to be kind of following a timeline and then where the scriptures come into play, and we're going to do some study in there. So what I want to kind of do is give folks, I have to tell you, it was so interesting on Thursday, I meet with the pastors in town, you know, and I, and I, I mention that every once in a while. There are kind of Two groups, and there's one group that's called uh, Interfaith Fellowship, and that's all kinds of different faiths, and it's mostly about helping the food bank and social things. That's great, and it's great, and we're involved with feeding the 5,000. I don't go to those meetings, um, but our other one is uh, really a prayer group, and it's more like more of us kind of like-minded folks, Gate City Christian and First Baptist, and The Rock, that's a four-square church, and uh, Rocky Mountain Ministry, that's a Nazarene church, and different churches, UBC. Pastor Reinhold, I love Pastor Reinhold. That guy's a good dude. That's a good guy. He's doing great work there. And that church is growing. Uh, University of Bible on Cypher Road. He's a good guy. Um, I like them all. Pastor Triplett, we're all in that group together. This was so interesting. So it just happened to come up in prayer. I, I made the request because we pray for what's happening in the Middle East. That, that the gospel is not hindered. Here's the thing. We should all pray against war. War stops the gospel being preached. Right? Just, you're all about survival. You go to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know what, what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. Survival is the first one. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about spiritual things. If it's here. Now, we can act as Christians in those times, right? We can really care for others and hurting and our prayers. But war and World War Three. now, is that... Is that God's hammer on our world to say, come back to me? I, I certainly don't think God desires that methodology. But could God use it? I'm not praying for that. I'm praying to avoid that. What we are always praying for in the church is the ability to share the gospel, the ability for people. Because really, arguing over dirt and race and things like that is so stupid. And it's so broken. And we've done it forever. Every nation, tribe, and race has done this. We us too over history. You know, it just kills me. So anyway, sorry. I just wanted to be. I'm, I'm hoping for the chance. Anyway, I'm praying against that. Yes, please. I had a question today when you said, well, you said it how when COVID came along, how it really people stopped coming to church, and you said. Um, 
years ago there were 600 that came to the African yeah. and mm -hmm. the other day there was 200 and I thought, okay, so God is, he knows everything. He's in charge of everything. Mm -hmm. He allows things to happen. So what was his purpose of the COVID? Knowing that a mm -hmm. lot of people will quit coming to church, what is, what? It, there was a purpose, but I was sitting there thinking, so what was the purpose? Well, and here's our way of looking at how does okay. God do things. We don't see God, that God sent COVID to us. Yeah. We're not, we don't, that's not how we run that. Mm -hmm. It's a broken world, mm -hmm. and broken world, and broken people don't function right. Mm -hmm. well, the, our theology is much more, God is completely aware of it, mm -hmm. and he is ready to work through the very broken, horrible stuff when we call upon his name. Get what I'm saying? So could God use it to say, does it, so in other words, God doesn't wish evil on anybody, right? He longs for all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God is love, by definition. God is love. But he cannot force anyone to love, right? That's not love. God is not, God will not coerce. God will not force. God invites. So, I believe God is weeping almost constantly <laughs> as he observes our world. Is it, does he not? Okay, he knows this happened. He knows the results of it. So then, what? So what might God be doing through it? Yes. Okay, very good. That's I agree question. with that question absolutely, and that's not that I really disagree. What might God do through this? I think it's a call. This is a hard road for pastors to travel right now, because on the one hand, we want to kind of go, everybody, get your rear ends back in church. What are you doing? I mean, because what we've lost is the people who came once every six to eight weeks. Gone. Gone. Folks that were deeply vested, pretty much all came back. But if you were kind of an observer, but, and people have said to me, well, that's fine. They were not really connected anyway. And I go, what are you kidding? I said, so getting them not at all is better than getting them once every six or eight weeks? I would rather have the opportunity to share the gospel and share, let the Holy Spirit work than to not have any chance at all. So, I'll get you one second, Bob. So, my, I believe that God is, on the one hand, where are you going to put your trust? I think God is asking that question to us. So, okay, you've been lied to on four quarters and, and lied to all over the place. From all sides. I'm not picking no sides here, okay? And, and it's not always lies. Half the time, it's we're not going to tell you everything. <laughs> we leave out half the information. So I believe this is a huge call. And you've heard me say it constantly, put not your trust in princes, put your trust in the larger God. So I am really convinced that when we see those nationwide and, and global, God is stopping and saying, okay, are you people done screwing around yet? You know, screwing around with false gods, false leaders, false whatever. Trust in me. We're all broken. I mean, even if I was your governor or president, I'm all screwed up. I mean, I think I would tell you the truth, but I don't know. I mean, we're all broken humans. So God in the end is saying, will you trust me now? That's hard because we're not finding people doing that. Really. So I think it's that. That's what I think. I think God is often, like remember when we study the book of Revelation? I have described this to you. The book of Revelation is God's sledgehammer and megaphone to the world. It's like, can you hear me now? Whack! Are you paying attention yet? <laughs> and it's not pretty. It's like God's last ditch effort. I mean, if you see your kid, what would you do if your kid, you knew, was absolutely destroying themselves. You just wash your hands and step back. So that's, that's, that's their life, not mine. So it's definitely dividing the very faithful from the... Uh, I don't know that it's God dividing them. So I think it's no. God presenting... Yes, to, and it's just happening. Please come home. I think the church is in kind of a resetting mode mm -hmm. in some ways. It's hard. Let me tell you this. Uh, this is hard for me. I, uh, we talked about it in staff this week. I'm about ready to pull about 75, 80, maybe even 100 chairs out of the sanctuary. 
and make our seating a little more user friendly and comfortable. In all my years of ministry, I've never taken chairs out. I've always added chairs. <laughs> it's hard for me. It's God doing a reset in my mind, too. <clears throat> what constitutes success? What's godly? What's. It's tricky. It's a tricky time, yeah. Well, isn't there like. Um, you know, public hospitals and like adventures and broadcasting. Oh, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Having different avenues to approach a changing cultural uh, phenomenon of like web access. I do. I do think there's all kinds of neat possibilities there. Here's the way I describe it. Like, you know, for instance, I've told you this before. When I see a guest come in, I think I probably said this to you, Connie, when you came the first time. I said, wow, thank you for being so brave. It's hard to walk into a new church the first time. It's hard. It's kind of scary. Especially when you hear the media. You know, Christians are yucky people, don't you know? Christians are horrible. They hate gay people. And, you know, like, you know, they're racist. And, gosh, they're just nasty. Why would you go there? I mean, it's a hard sell. I, I believe one of the major issues right now is I hear this all the time. Oh, the church is this, and the church is that, and the church is that. And I always say, have you experienced that here? And I'm like, have you really? And I was like, oh, no, not here. And I go, what are you? Because <laughs> if you experience it here, we will fix that. I mean, if I hear, I remember one time, I had somebody, there was two times, I'll give you two times when I was really snarky. Actually, there was probably a third time. <laughs> one time, the most snarky I've ever been in a sermon, Somebody had just really complained to me about how long my sermons were. And I said, you know, they'd be shorter if you showed up every week. <laughs> you know, if I only get you once every three weeks, i got to really talk to you. You know, So that was as snarky as I've ever been. In a, and, and actually, I'm, that's only partially tongue-in-cheek. In all seriousness, if we could get, our, you know, our five, the 500 adults who really make up this church, really 500. They came every week. I'd probably preach for 15 minutes, knowing that I would have you next week, and I'd have 200 of you in Bible class. We could really walk together through the Word together, just so faithfully and incrementally. And you could add all kinds of cool, beautiful enhancements into your worship, and give people the opportunity to share their faith, and you know, prayers. And faith. You could do some cool things. But man, when I only get you on average once a month, that's kind of the average across the whole board. <coughs> then I better make sure you get some good stuff. You kind of got to get the whole thing. It's just like Lutheran hymns. We tell you all our theology in every hymn. That's a joke, by the way. I'm kind of making a funny there. But we tell you all our theology in one. I'm kind of doing that in our ser in sermons. I'm making sure you kind of get a big hunk. So, um, but, but here's the challenge with the social media and stuff. Because we, uh, it's very interesting for us. We get 200 solid views every week. <coughs> 200. We have a church in, uh, oh, I was talking about being snarky. So, right now, in the Northwest District, four states, Grace Lutheran, I, I just found this out, we worship the most people in person in four states in our denomination. Not by much. Uh, by about 20 people because we have about 120 at 830 we have about say 180 to 220 so let's say 211 was that 320 and then we get about 30 on five o'clock and then our nursing homes it's about 15 between the two or 20. so we're like 350 36 370 something like that that's the most in four states now, there's a church in Tacoma that says they have 750 coming, but they count all their online people at two. Mm -hmm. And we don't count anyone at online, because we don't know. You don't know, right? We know that we're getting 200 every week, 200 views. So our guess is that we count that at about one and a half in our own internal discussion. At about one and a half, we think that's low. What they say is for sustained views of church services, the number is actually 2.5. That's actually the real average that they kind of now study after the pandemic. We counted at one and a half, but we don't include it in our numbers we report. But if we did, right, that would be 600 and 
70 would be our attendance. So that's good, right? That's good. But really, our in-person attendance is 370. So, what I think we've done after the pandemic with social media and technology and so forth is we broadened the pool, but not deepened it. Mm. So we broadened it. We're reaching more people. But if I can get you guys sitting here, right? And I'm, I'm not bragging, but isn't this true? When we get time like this together, we kind of get after it. I mean, it's that I don't cover much material is actually really good. It means we've gone a little deeper into stuff that you could never do in a sermon, right? You can't have that conversation. And you can ask questions, and we can reflect, and we can... So if we get this and get this together, boy, if we, get, if we get word, service, worship, people are changed. And that, that we've just discovered here now, we're like at about half, 250 adults really kind of make this church happen. That's the deal. I give you all the bad. We study it all the time. Because we're always saying, how can we do better? What can we do more? How do we reach more people? So that's what's going on. One of the scariest things for me that I read in the Bible is that some of, in the end, even some of the elect will fall away. Oh, yeah. And is that, are we there? Or, I mean, ugh. God. Well, okay, now I'm going to really kind of talk out of school. One of the heaviest parts of my heart is so many Christian denominations have lost their way. And when I say lost their way, I don't mean that they don't practice communion the way we do. I mean they have given up on Scripture. They have given up on Christ alone. The full sufficiency of grace. They've given up on those things. And they want to be cool or light or socially relevant or whatever. None of those things are evil unless they supplant Christ. I mean, of course we should be socially relevant. Oh, Bob, you were going to say something, and I ignored you. Well, I was just going to say my biggest worry is that it's basically a symptom of people having drifted away from God and Him allowing this to happen to them because that's a consequence an earthly consequence of not having God in your life. Sure. Well, prodigal son. It's, it's, it's a story of the prodigal son. Think of how many people, too, right? I mean, and again, I, please don't read me wrong. The church has sometimes been its own worst enemy. We have sometimes shot ourselves in the foot. Sometimes our conversations in the parking lot or in the public square are not as gracious as they should be. Sometimes they are not as patient as they should be. Sometimes we are quick to judge. And sometimes our offhand comments come back and bite us in the rear end pretty hard. It's a constant vigilance of being gracious, of being kind, there but for the grace of God go I. It's not pointing fingers at others, but rather holding up Christ. And sometimes the church has fallen into that trap of pointing our fingers at others and not pointing it at ourselves, walking very humbly, but I, I am going to champion this till the day I die if God gives me the privilege of serving to hold up Christ. Just keep holding up Christ. Amen. And if we can do that, I feel like we're being faithful. Mm -hmm. And we want to do it in a compelling way. And, but Teresa and I, it was, it was hard on us Wednesday. We had those kids, and we're sitting there sobbing because we love the African Children's Choir. We've been working with them for almost 30 years in different locations in Seattle and Portland and here. And to watch after five years, because they didn't do it for like with the pandemic, we had them scheduled for 2021. And they can't, had to cancel. We had them scheduled. And to watch those kids come roaring in, you know, dropping, running into the sanctuary. And we just said, Teresa and I went, and our hearts are just heavy. We're not mad at people. We're sad that they missed it. We're just so sad because it was so inspiring. It just filled my cup so completely. It was just way cool. And we're sitting there going, what do we have to do? <laughs> Because, you know, you do this event, you do that event, you do this kind of cool thing in worship and this and that. And now it's like, eh. And then Teresa and I sit there and say, are we too old? Maybe it's good we're retiring. Maybe we're not very good at this anymore. You know, and you go through all of those things, and our staff does it too. What do we do? How do we do it? And our, the only way I know how to do it in the end is that, because we can't, it's all of our family saying, hey, you should come. You know, hey, I heard something that encouraged me. I experienced something that was powerful. So, 
that's kind of the idea. Now I'm off track. But the next thing I'm doing is this history of, of the land of Israel. And, and I'm going to do, I got a, so I found a great source. Um, the author's name is Walter Kaiser, and uh, he is one of the best Old Testament uh, professors I've ever, I took a class from him, read several of his books. He's not Lutheran, but boy, he's good in the Old Testament. I just really like him. So I'm excited about seeing that and then seeing how it kind of translates into the New Testament also. So that's the next thing, if you're interested. I need to pray. Lord, I am so grateful for these folks that, because we're your family together, and in this place at this time, uh, you've called us by name, and you've uh, made us your own, and we're united in the, in the person and work of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who we worship, and who we know loves us, and so we pray, Lord, that, that uh, we would grow ever closer to Christ in such a way that that with him before us, always before us, uh, others can see that and in our conversations and in our invitations people would know and rejoice in a God who loves, a God who knows and still invites and uh, shows his, his compassion. Lord, we're in the passion now. There's no greater example of that. As we hear it from the gospel writers, made it rich and deep in our understanding of the depth of your love for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I've got this, and if you didn't get one, there are fresh ones back there, new ones. Finally, our copier went down. I sent a little bit this week because it was frustrating. <laughs> Teresa is so funny. My wife can be a battle axe sometimes. She's pretty great. She thinks she's a well, sweet little girl, right? And she was mad, man, with the copier. And they were just goofing around and being dopey and say, oh, you love the part today. That was like Tuesday. And then nothing. It's still broken. So finally, on Thursday, she says, so you're going to make all our copies for us? No. And she said, here, make all these copies. And they did them all wrong, by the way. You got them today. They were the wrong size. But they made all the copies. And then she said, and they said, well, I guess we could maybe get you a loaner. She said, darn right. <laughs> she was good. So anyway, there's fresh ones. I, and again, I just think this is a very cool resource. So we finished at the bottom of seven. This was Herod, right? Remember, Herod wanted to see, we're at eight, yeah, top of eight. Herod wanted to see um, kind of a magic trick was the idea. And Jesus just uh, uh, sorely disappointed him. So then, you remember your color coding here. Luke is green, and I think that's green, isn't it? And then the blue is John. And those are the two we're really focusing in on here through this really important section and again, here's the, here's the point. So remember, John written later. John really <coughs> focuses in on the kingship of Jesus. What does that kingdom look like? That kingdom language. And, uh, and in Luke, remember that Luke is the author of Acts also. And in the book of Acts, Luke carefully lays out Paul's trial. Luke applies the same eyewitness. He gathered eyewitness testimony and carefully lays out the detail of Jesus' trial also. Kind of perilous. That's just insight for you. That's their focus. Okay, top of eight. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, right? Herod kicked him back. Kicked him back to Pilate. By the way, they're both in town at the same time. Herod, nominally a Jew, kind of a cultural Jew. Um, um, Herod's in town. And Pilate's in town, both of them in town. Pilate governed from Caesarea on the coast. That was his place. And Herod from Tiberias, which was north in Galilee, on the Sea of Galilee. So when there was a big festival, I'll just see if I get my... Okay, here's Caesarea on the coast. Jerusalem here, Caesarea. Tiberias up here. He would come to Jerusalem. Big festivals, big problems riots and stuff like that. So they both are there to keep the peace. So, said to them, you brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. This is very similar to Paul, the account of Paul's trial that Luke does. Very similar. <laughs> Felix and Festus really don't find fault in him, and he kind of tells this to the Jewish leaders. Please remember, in Paul's trial, 
the Jewish leaders have brought Paul before him and saying, this man is a mess. This man is inciting the people. This man is... Do you get the parallel? The Jewish leaders are bringing Jesus before Pilate and Herod. This man is inciting the people. So he goes to not one, but two different uh, powers, Herod and Pilate. It very much parallels Paul. It's not, he's not saying they're equal, but Luke is showing that what happened to Jesus and to Paul is all in kind of historical record. The audience that Luke is going after, which are Hellenized people, right, Greek speakers, Jews and Gentiles, that's Luke's audience, recognize this. It gives great validity to the testimonies of that. This is common in that culture. It follows that pattern. Yeah, so, go ahead, question. Mike. Yeah. So how is it that the Sanhedrin has, I mean, Pilate just basically pronounced judgment. He said, he's not guilty. Correct. Why didn't he just say, go home? He should have. And he wanted to. He's afraid of a riot. It really, I, I mean, and that may sound silly, but here's the thing. What's his, what are his options? Go home. They don't. They start rioting. What does he do? It's Passover. Does he kill a few hundred of them as an example? And you get a bigger riot. I mean, honestly, what's happening in the Middle East right now, there's some parallels here. What do you do? Do you go blow up every Hamas, Hamas stronghold? Because they got a hospital above it? And they got little children? Do you do that? Is that what you do? So, you know, think about the dilemmas facing Israel right now. How do we respond? That's what Pilate's facing. And his primary rule, the rule of Rome is, keep the peace or we'll find someone who will. Because we need the taxes to come. And not just, we can't have a peace that means everybody's hacked at you. It has to be kind of a peace, a real peace, so business is happening the, the economies money, are working. Money keeps flowing. Money keeps flowing. That's a big deal. That's rule number one for the Roman Empire. It's hard to run an empire. It's expensive. And so that these are all sources of income that head to Rome that fund their empire's um, expansion. So that's why. Now, he does do it. Pilate, what we know about Pilate is brutal. He murders, just takes, says, line them up, kills them all. 8,000 Galileans. 8,000. Just lines them up and kills them. And he does that to prove a point. Get yourself in line. So. Yeah. Um, Pilate was really actually trying to wash his hands of all this. But that when the Jews... Well, he does that in the end. When the Jews mentioned that something about Caesar, that's what the fear really came up, wasn't it? Oh, gosh, yeah. The, the, the Jewish leaders know what notes to hit. Yeah. We have no king but Caesar. I mean, they're just lying through their teeth. Yeah. They don't believe that. But that really got to Pilate. I think Pilate then said, whoa, wait a minute here. I might... Well, what I'm he in, keeps... I'm, in, I'm walking on thin ground now. Here's what he's then seeing. I'm... He tries, right? Think about it. What does he try? First of all, let me interview him. He goes... This, this guy's done nothing wrong. No, we still want to kill him. Then he goes, because he and he's a Galilean. He goes, Galilean? Let's get Herod to check it out. It'd be Herod's problem. Herod goes, mm-mm. Sends him back. So now Pilate's like, right? He comes back and he says, look, neither Herod nor I found anything wrong with him. Look, I'll beat him for you. How about that? I'll do that. No, they're still screaming. So he's, then, then what does he do, right? So then he flaunts him, right? He, and you have this great interview. We're going to do that. What's the next thing? I'm going to release someone to you at Passover. Barabbas, you want Osama bin Laden, or you want this Jesus character? Seriously. <clears throat> or in the current moment, you want the leader of Hamas? Or do you want this Jesus character? And they're going, I mean, it reminds me of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Do you remember the scene where they've got the witch? <laughs> it's that scene. And they just, they can't, you can't talk sense to them. You can't talk sense to them. Burn and crucify him, you know, that's what you're getting. So he tries that. He tries this prisoner exchange, right? Certainly I'll offer you somebody who's such a scum of the earth, you'll never want him. And they choose him over Jesus. Um, and then what's he do? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, then he scourge him. Scourging is, scourging ended in death of the person more than half the time. Just loss of blood. Um, I forget what kind of shock is called. Anaphylactic. 
something like that. They go into shock, loss of blood, dehydration. It killed many, many, many victims. So he said, I'll scourge him. How about that? Good enough? I'll mock him. I'll put a robe on him. I'll, put, I'll let the soldiers spit on him. I'll put a crown of thorns on him. How about that? Right? So he's doing everything he can up to, because what he doesn't want, because he's no dummy. This guy has been observing the popularity of Jesus among the people. So he's no he's got a whole crowd of peasants. The vast majority of the population love this guy. And then he's got all these religious leaders demanding that they crucify him. He is genuinely caught between a rock and a hard place. Now what's interesting is, the Jews took the heat for the crucifixion of Jesus for generation after generation. Once again, this is a stain on the, on the Christian church. Not the true church, but on how the institutional church took up the mantle of persecuting Jews. The institutional church has been among the greatest offenders of the persecution of Jews, especially in Europe. The Inquisition, it's horrible. It's a horrible era. But that's, that doesn't come about until about 900, 7, 8, 900 years. That's when it really kicks in. But they blame the Jews for killing Jesus. That was the thing that Jews were called Christ killers. For many, many generations, Christ killers. That was what it was called. And our creeds, which predate that time, are clear. How do our creeds read? Suffered under Pontius Pilate, not under Caiaphas. It was the Romans who chose to kill Jesus. It was, that was who killed Jesus. So our creeds are clear, and that comes up later. Um, so anyway, you can see what happens. That's the, that's the rock and the hard place he's in. He, what do I do? So let's just follow it here. So while he was sitting, this, we're up at, on the yellow on page 8 at the top. <clears throat> while he was sitting on the judgment seat, right, this is where the, the Roman governor made judgments, pronouncements in the praetorium, his wife said to him, nothing to do with that just man for I've suffered many things in a dream because of him isn't that an interesting interview mm -hmm. right such an interesting interview I don't know about you I, if my wife had said that to me I'd have really taken no but it's a different culture isn't it I mean women were not really had, had very low status and at the same time for her to dream about this random man, and they're, they all believe in every God you could imagine, they would have said, this is a message, and it's coming to me from a source I don't like to have to take messages from, but it's a message. And it's somewhat close to me, at least, whether I... Isn't it interesting that it's Matthew? I've never figured that out. Why Matthew? It's not prophecy. She's not Jewish. It's very interesting to me. The only thing I can think of in this case is why Matthew has it. You know, Judaism, and, and uh, let me give you an interesting parallel. I said at the African Children's Choir, so let me go back to that for a minute. I'm sitting there watching them, and you know, when I watch kids sing about Jesus, I just cry. I sit, it's a good thing I sit in the front row. I just sit there and cry. It's just so powerful to me. And they really do. If you don't know this, Africa is Christian. I mean, overwhelmingly. Sub-Saharan Africa is now approaching 90%. The three largest Lutheran churches in the world are all in Africa. So Tanzania, and by the way, thank God for German colonists in that sense, because they brought Lutheranism. I mean, they brought the gospel. And Tanzania is the largest Lutheran church right now, unless you count like Sweden, in which there are like 10 million Lutherans because it's a state church, and four of them go to church. You know? So, I mean, we don't count that. But in Tanzania, it's like 10 million Lutherans. We have 2 million in our denomination here, here in America. And, we, and, we, and we're so arrogant. We're so sick of We should be going to them and saying, how do you do it? <laughs> Teach us. We're so, oh my goodness, right? Well, here's, you know, what's part of, so anyway, Ethiopia, is, oh no, the second largest Lutheran church in the world is, yeah, Ethiopia, Makane Yesu. They baptize like over 300,000 adults a year. It's, a, it's just a it's torrent. And then the third one is Mozambique. Like five million. Crazy. 
Anyway, it's so cool. These are churches that are affiliated with us. And the uh, and the and they come to America and they hear us talk and see what we're facing and they say, I just heard a Christian person talk about this, whatever it is. Euthanasia, abortion, same sex marriage, and they go, and they're always so they're so innocent, they're so delightful. They come and they go, Are you reading the same book? You know, is what and they're very earnest, they're not being mocking. They just go, how can this be in America, which is, in their mind, is a Christian country? Very interesting. Anyway, I told the group, I used to say, at, when I would speak at the African Children's thing, I would say, these kids, this is giving them hope. Education, safety, clean water, good food, good education. It's great. This is a hope for them and their community. And you could argue even hope for their nation. Kenya is where these kids were all. Oh, no, Uganda is where they were all from. This, this group. And now I'm saying, they may be the hope of the world, for real. Because they just love Jesus. And they just, they want to follow him, and they want to honor him. It is very cool. And we have, we have too much of American Christianity is kind of wandering in the wilderness right now. Anyway, focus on Christ. So, so here he goes, okay? So why does Matthew do this? Here's what I imagine. One of the reasons why it's, uh, Christianity is, is just exploding is they assume the presence of God. They assume the supernatural. They're not, you can see in a Western culture, we're like all scientific and everything. Although I will tell you this, I work on electricity like places, and I tell people all the time, electricity is sorcery <laughs> to me. I mean, well, that sounds awful shock. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so anyway, but I mean, I just chuckle about it, but... My, my cell phone is absolutely sorcery to me. I have no idea how this thing works. But boy, I use it, you know. But in Africa, so we kind of poo-poo that stuff, and I go, great, as soon as you can explain how to use your cell phone, then we'll pretend you're, you're really scientific. We just assume things. They assume that God is active and present in this world. They assume there are fallen angels which are working against the will of God. They assume the supernatural. That God will act. They assume that. And so for that reason, that the tomb is empty, and that Christ is Lord, and God of all, um, they're all in. Very cool. It's a, harder, it's a harder road for us, but we've lost it. It's hard to regain it. Okay. So that's why I think Matthew includes this, because Jews in his day assumed it. Assumed that kind of thing. She had a dream. These guys should have paid attention. That's to your point. Okay. Now, the feast, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing the multitude one prisoner. We know this story. He had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Barabbas was a robber who was chained with his fellow rebels, thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city, and for murder they had committed in the rebellion. Isn't that interesting? Look at that. We have all the colors there that give you the full picture of the Barabbas story. Isn't that kind of neat? I think that's kind of cool. When you put them all together, you get the full story of Barabbas. He was a murderer, he led a rebellion, it was in the city, and he was, his reputation was notorious. Okay? Um, then the multitude crying aloud began to ask him to do just as he has always done for them. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, you have a custom that I should release somebody who would pass over, whom therefore do you want me to release to you, Barabbas, or Jesus, which is called Christ, the king of the Jews. For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd, so that he should rather release to Barabbas to them and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they all cried out at once, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Away with this man, that release to us Barabbas. Okay, this will sound political, but it just it confounds me. Did you see there was 100,000 Palestinian protesters in London? 100,000. Condemning Israel, calling for the elimination of this nation of Israel, which means the extermination of Jews. That's what that means, the elimination of the nation. And establishing a Palestinian state from the river to the sea. 100,000. And I sit there and I go, that's this crowd. Somehow, so we shouldn't be that shocked. I am still. I, maybe it's, I still want to be shocked. But it's happened. Here's this Jesus who has, in the sight of many of these people, healed and taught 
and shown mercy and stood up for, remember, casting out money changers. You know, he kind of stood up for what was true and what was right, stood up for the underprivileged, stood up for the poor. And then, just like that, whoop, whack, they're on this side. So I don't, I think these are always lessons to us. So Shanna, here's, this maybe speaks a little to your previous question. We should not be surprised when things happen that we go, how could this happen? How could people react this way? Because that's what you do when you read this, don't you? Don't you read that? How could they do that? Do they have, not have eyes? Uh, part of the thing I believe right now is how hard it is to trust. Like, when I say I don't trust any news source anymore, this is what I mean. They have to prove it to me. I no longer take what they say the first time they say it. I'm like, okay, let's keep listening. I need another source, and I need another source. Whereas, when Walter Cronkite said it, I believed it. <laughs> I'm tired of that. I mean, when somebody like Tucker Carlson or Rachel Maddow says it, I automatically am like, eh. Right? I don't know. So I need him to prove it, is what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. So he says, okay, give us Barabbas. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. So what he's saying in the back of his mind, man, if this guy dies in the crowds, this could be bad. This could go really bad. Again called out to them and said, what then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? They all cried out to him again, let him be crucified, crucify him, crucify him. Then Pilate said to them the third time, now here's an interesting thing you should know. The Romans didn't crucify everybody. That was not every capital offense. You picked crucifixion victims for very specific reasons. To send a message to the people. Because right, they would stand, they would be there out in the open, usually three, four, five days. That's how long you could keep someone alive in that horrible condition. <coughs> and so they, and it was typically for like rebellious slaves, the worst of all capital offenses, multi-mass murderers, serial killers, it was those. It didn't, a Roman citizen could never be crucified. That was, never. And so this is very interesting that they're calling for that. Not just execute him or throw him in the dungeon, but that particular form of crucifixion. Here, let me give you my read on this. This is, I'm not dogmatic. Is it just me talking like we're having a beer? I think, I think they call for this. Jesus needed to be crucified. Not just, it, it was prophesied. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree was prophesied. They pierced his hands and his feet. I've been... But you were sin. You were, you were evil. You were the personification of evil. Jesus on the cross becomes those things, right? Why God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? If you want to think of the Trinity as a seamless cloth, think of taking a piece of seamless cloth and tearing it. That's what's happening on the cross. There's a tearing. Again, I don't say this to you for macabre. For you. This is how deeply we're loved. The people of God, how we, how we are, all of humanity, all of humanity, how deeply we're loved. I think that form of crucifixion was the personification. It was kind of like in Jesus' birth, you have the incarnation of God. You have God's presence, goodness, perfection in our midst. In crucifixion, it's the, it's the incarnation of sin. He is sin. Remember what Paul says? God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might attain the righteousness of God. That's what I think. So this is a very interesting that that's what they're calling for. Then Pilate said to them a third time, Why? What evil has he done? I found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices, this is the third time Right? He said, I'll chastise him. Isn't that going to be enough for you guys? I'll beat him. Let him be crucified. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. By the way, gosh, look at that line right there. Gosh. Where's the other line? It's in 
mark, it just blows me away. It says that a lion is this, then they crucified him. Sorry. He does not have it in this conflated thing. It's it's not. I was reading a commentary. Mark 15, 24. Thank you. Mark 15, 24. That's what I was reading was that commentary. Because the commentator said. Mark 15, 24. Yes, there it is. <coughs> So they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, and he did not take it. And they crucified him. And when you know what that means, then he, the commentator went to a lengthy description of what crucifixion meant. That statement, and, and this, if there's something lost in our in our Christianity today, I think it is the the depth and the reality of the crucifixion and the absolute victory that is Easter. Easter is not just a happy day. Easter is the grave is empty. <laughs> Every one of us are going to face it. Right? Every one of us. And the, the, the Easter makes that faceable. You know? but the crucifixion... The crucifixion is... is is the measure of God's love. And the tomb is the measure of his victory. And ox, I mean, the trend is, anyway. We've got, we got to stop there. You know, where, where do we stop? Where should we say we stop? At the scourging. So then Pilate took him and scourged him. We'll stop there. And then they take him, they, they put a robe on him, and then uh, we'll do that. And then we get this statement about, then we get this lengthy conversation between him and Pilate about truth and power, and we'll talk about that next week. It's good. Chastise yeah. and scourging, is that the same? Uh, it's, it's a similar word, but that's what it entailed. It would mean mocking and spitting and beating and a whole series of things, but it could include scourging. Scourging is a very specific phrase, that term. So chastise is the big word. We're going we're gonna to torture you. You all, you all those things. Yeah. Scourging the word. Scourge is actually the whip. The so. actual word, the whip. So it's a noun, which you could turn into a word. It's a horrible thing. It's a horrible and thing. And most people die in that. Most people die from it. Yeah. At least half. Let's, uh, anyway, good. Oh, happy Reformation. Praise God. Uh, let's say the blessing. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up.